Bienvenidos todos ustedes, welcome everybody. I have sad news because the end of the world just came and uh, guess what? Just a few people survived. Luckily, this, the people that survived in this occasion, it's uh, one group of the brightest people that I, I have ever known. And allow me to introduce them because uh, this is the people that you will be dealing for the rest of the end of times. First of all, we have Ian Trigilis. How are you doing, Ian? Thank you. <laughs> you survived the apocalypse. <laughs> so far, it's, I don't know, it's only 7 o'clock for me, so. <laughs> Perhaps it, it, ha it hasn't reached your region in there, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, and uh, then we have another survivor from a different part of the country, a different country where I am located, Mark Russell. How are you doing, Mark? Doing good, doing good. <laughs> it's excellent to have you back. <laughs> Feeling apocalyptic, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, definitely, always. Hey, excellent, excellent. And uh, perhaps it's not apocalyptic, but uh, she she had to deal with something that was really troublesome, uh, but luckily she survived, and also the equipment where she's uh, transmitting right now. Blanca, how are you in Blanca? Quite fine, since I, I already survived the technological apocalypse right here <laughs> in my machine, so it's fine. <laughs> excellent. It, it's a good uh, thing about having an extra, extra a spare set of equipment in this case. And somebody who knows a lot about equipment and getting ready for uh, perhaps the apocalypse, uh, at least in a storytelling way, Tom Merritt, how are you doing, Tom? Good. I, w I wish I could have helped Blanca avoid her apocalypse. It's the end of the world as we know it, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and please don't, don't, don't say something else because we don't want uh, YouTube to uh, take down this video, but we all have, I mean, we all have some sort of experience. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as long as we don't sing. Okay, so this is a particular panel that we have in here, and uh, I am really glad. Uh, I, I already thank them uh, before the transmission, but uh, Mark, Ian, Tom, Blanca, thank you very much for accepting the, the, the invitation for this presentation. And we're going to be talking about storytelling, and one of the favorite topics that, uh, uh, well, this is one of my favorite topics that are being present in a lot of works, and it is the post-apocalypse. Because, well, in, in a lot of works from the science fiction, from the science fiction, or science fiction, it doesn't need to be, uh, it's uh, one of the things that uh, perhaps can uh, become more fascinating because it helps us to push uh, part of the of the characters and put them in, 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 in places where they usually don't deal uh, as, uh, as part of the reality. Uh, but we have different parts and different stories in there. Uh, in there, uh, each one of us is, uh, is going to discuss uh, one of these and, uh, or present one of these topics, and then we're going to discuss part of what this makes or, or doesn't make interesting. And uh, I'm really glad because, for example, you, uh, if you follow Churros y Palomitas, the main place where this is uh, uh, taking place, uh, uh, we have already the chance to discuss different topics with the panel that we have in here. And uh, uh, they all quite analyze and uh, present this kind of stories. They have a lot of experience. For example, Ian uh, knows a little bit about time travel, uh, the same that uh, Tom. Uh, Mark knows a lot about that. Uh, he's my, uh, my my reference for, uh, for example, Mark is my reference for uh, the apocalyptic, uh, but uh, perhaps not in the mean uh, in the meaning that a lot of you uh, uh, associate because well he knows a lot about. It. He's my favorite evangelist as I as uh, once I told him, and he knows about the apocalypse or about the revelations, which which is a, a, a different meaning that we have in here. Tom, you also have written about the, the end of times, and you are uh, you have already presented one one book that I really enjoyed, and the second one is coming soon, right? That's right. Yeah, March twenty fourth. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we will uh, let you all know uh, the details about uh, the, the different works. And Blank is a specialist uh, in in uh, in, in uh, post apocalyptic uh, interpretations. We already have a show about, about Blade Runner and Blade Runner. Uh, well, the sequel of Blade Runner, twenty forty six. I usually mistake the dates. Uh, and uh, well, it was one of the most uh, enjoyed shows. And Blanca, let's go first with you, because uh, about this kind of stories, uh, I have already mentioned that perhaps the green futures are kind of uh, popular. Uh, but uh, am I wrong? Is it right? Uh, are, are there any works of art, any novels, any TV shows, movies, perhaps that deal deal with this kind of a scenario? And uh, what can they tell us about human nature? I don't know. 
Well, uh, there are there 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 is a lot of of uh, narrative work that has been done, especially since the 19th century, when we started to uh, to live with uh, machines that really accelerate the the way we used to live. You know? so um, I guess stories. Uh, the stories we tell unfold a lot about what we desire, what we expect, especially what uh, about what we fear, and uh, these fears can find I don't know some kind of crucible in this uh, post-apocalyptic images in which we are mainly deprived of everything we cherish, uh, but especially the, uh, all the things that make our lives easier. However, I was thinking about uh, when you send us the topics, I was thinking about uh, how these uh, future scenarios are not really so futuristic. Uh, in many ways, uh, the post-apocalyptic, let's call it desire, the post-apocalyptic narrative desire, I think, deals more about how we feel right now in the present that, uh, than what is actually going to happen. For instance, uh, we've been reading uh, lately a lot about Ray Bradbury uh, for both for Race Causa and for the uh, book fair in Mineria downtown. And we find a lot of things that uh, are more significant right now and that are uh, unfolding a lot of the human nature that we live and we face every day today than uh, actually building something about uh, a post-apocalyptic or even apocalyptic uh, future. So, uh, I think uh, stories, for instance, like um, your race at Blade Runner, I've been working with Philip K. Dix, to Android's dream, uh -huh. but not uh, exactly about uh, this, but the connection it has to... Oh, 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 there you are, there you are. <laughs> become human, a video game designed by... Um, uh, Ubisoft, uh, okay. there you are. Mm -hmm. by, there it, sure. by David Cage, the designer David Cage, and it's about how we're being treated and we are assuming our uh, human existence as part of a um, machinery and we are not uh, feeling like human beings, we are not treating each other like human beings. Yeah, it's like our sense of life is just restricted to how we are contributing to this economical machinery. And that's uh, what Detroit Become Human uh, is about. It's about disobedience. It's about, um, I guess it's a It's about disobedience. It's about becoming human through rebellion and through taking an ethical stand. So, uh, for instance, these kind of productions are not. Uh, uh, I was also thinking about Philip K. Dick's uh, Electric Dreams that recently has been adapted by Amazon Prime as a TV uh, streaming series. And oh, mm. <laughs> there you are. I said, I said, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, this adaptation, even though it's working with other kind of technologies. It's working with digital technologies. It's talking about the internet. It's talking about uh, drones and uh, digital surveillance. Uh, it's still working with the, all the human conflicts that, that were uh, identified by and uh, well, uh, well identified by Philip K. Dick. You no, know? so I guess more like. Um, Thinking about science fiction as an, a way of building worlds beyond our 
nowadays existence. I think it's a way to make essays on philosophic subjects, mm -hmm. on the conflicts of the human condition, the things that we are worrying about. I was thinking also about, for instance, an older video game, Dead Stranding, by uh, designer Hideo Kojima, that is also dealing with being left alone in a post-apocalyptic future and how uh, difficult it would be to make a, an internet connection work. But it's not about the internet, it's not about the cables, it's not about the power uh, you need to uh, take that net, uh, uh, to launch that net. It's about how you connect with other people and how your actions in that world in which you don't meet any other player uh, have an impact in the way they can they go they walk through that that, that world. Uh, you can make it easier. Someone else can make it difficult for you, and without noticing that you are uh, even there. And that's pretty cool. Cool because it's not about uh, a world that doesn't. Uh, that no longer exists, but it's about the world that we are living in, how difficult it is to connect with other people, how diff uh, difficult it is, even though we have all these resources, technical resources, technological resources, but we don't have, let's say, the human will to do it. We are still too afraid of, get of uh, getting through other humans, you know? All right. Well, uh, actually, I mean, we are running already deep into 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 this kind of uh, thing. I opened the about this topic about the, perhaps the relationship that we have about, about exploring the in this case about the human nature and uh, how we are perhaps uh, far from there. We're going to talk a little bit uh, actually more about that with Ian, but I opened the 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 mics. Uh, Mark, Tom, Ian, something that you want to add to this part? Yeah, so um, when you talk about apocalypse and about it being like something that in, in the games sort of interactive, it seems like the, the common thread is like there's um, every apocalypse, There's it's implied that there's also a future or there's something you can do within the apocalypse. Uh, is that kind of what you're part of what you're saying and or that it's not really so much an, as an end, but a transition? I don't know if that's a question. That's just my observation. <laughs> No, I guess it's better to think it that, like you're saying it, uh, a kind of opportunity of get rid of what we are not having a real, well, of everything we, we don't really need, need us um, in a transcendent, more transcendent sense. Uh, this is the game. Mm -hmm. The Dead Stranding. It's really awesome haven't uh, finished it yet. However, uh, I think it's about that, a, a transition, uh, a very uh, diachronic point of view of what uh, we can potentially do, virtually do, even though we can, uh, even though we might lost, well, we might lose our well, comfort zone made up of resources, uh, appliances, commodities. I don't know. Uh, it's another kind of world, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's also, I don't know what you think. Uh, it's a post-apocalyptic future. However, it's a future that is rich because you can build something else. You cannot, uh, you are not having the opportunity of sticking to what you already know, but you need to build a uh, new existential uh, views and perspectives as a human being, as a, a um, even as a creator, as a technician. Uh, I think it's more like that. I think you're right. It might be a, somehow a, a needed trans uh, transition. All right, there, there you are. Something that you want to add uh, or comment, Mark, about it? No, that's not great. <laughs> All right. And uh, uh, Wes, uh, 
guys, uh, Ian and Thompson have something to say. Perhaps we can discuss a little bit. I, it's actually related. Let me let me go with you, Tom. Um, and uh, for example, here uh, Blanca mentioned that perhaps it's uh, usually it can be as associated the, the apocalypse as the end of times, and it usually is as we have it in, in popular culture. But she mentioned something important. Perhaps it's just a step uh, that it's going to take us to a, a, a next stage. Uh, you have work in in uh, one of your novels. Uh, and one of the things that we actually discussed when we had the chance to talk about it, about uh, how you set the time, um, the timetable, to put it in one way, uh, with the character and the, the continuity that you, that you have in there. And for example, about the future, about the things that are happening. Can you include, perhaps in the story, uh, this end of time, this apocalyptic future, and then you establish it as, as, as Bianca was mentioning, just perhaps at the end of, uh, of a stage, and uh, not of an entire story. And how can you deal with this uh, with, with this kind of I don't know of uh, uh, chapter endings in this case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things in Pilot X uh, was that he needed to destroy the universe to save most of the people in it. So it's really talking directly to to what Blanca was discussing, I think, which is sometimes you know there's a transition where yes, you lose a lot, uh, but maybe what you gain in the post-apocalyptic scenario ends up being worth it or better or an improvement or you learn something from it. Uh, one of the things I tried to do with Pilot X was not make time changeable. Uh, so he couldn't go back and just fix something. Everything in the timeline uh, was was fixed. You know, if you went back into the past, the effects of what you did there would have already been felt in your present or your future. Uh, so that forced him to have to be more apocalyptic, to be more destructive. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, this kind of um, destruction, well, after all, it's, 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 also, it's uh, some sort of destruction. Uh, as you mentioned, something that I consider really important because we have uh, really good stories uh, in different media, for example, in movies, Back to the Future. And uh, when we have the transition uh, from the first film to the second film, uh, then you have an, an important event and then you have the in that case, you have the particular situation where you can actually fix the future just going to the past and then creating different timelines. So there you have, an, uh, it's not an easy fix. It depends, obviously, th there are no bad, not, not bad uh, characters, there are not bad ideas. It's always how you how you deal with, uh, with that. And something that I really appreciated in this case in your particular book and uh, generally in, in, in stories is that, okay, yeah, we're going to have these kind of things, but we have to deal with the consequences. It's, it's, it's not about taking perhaps an easy step and uh, like a control C or like when you lost a life in a video game, to put, up, to put what, one example. What other kind of works uh, uh, do you find where this has been dealt in the proper where, way where the consequences are actually the perhaps the bigger part of a story? It can be, I don't know, any book, any movie or something that you have in, a, in idea, Tom. Maybe it's uh, because Blanca was mentioning Philip K. Dick, but uh, the counterclock <laughs> world. Uh, pops to mind where uh, everything is going backwards and everyone knows, remembers their past, uh, and yet they can't avoid it. Uh, and they, they know what incidents they're heading towards. And, and it's, you know, definitely a commentary on free will and knowing the consequences of your actions and, and, and very clearly knowing like what the consequences of any actions would be, but in reverse. Uh, that, that's the first thing that pops to mind for me. All right, all right. Uh, guys, I will open the question um, for all of you, for Ian and for Mark, if you find another word that you think that it's relevant about this, about dealing, about the consequences, in this case, of the, of the actions. Uh, any of you want to mention some? Um, so I'm not familiar with the, the P.K. Dick work that Tom mentioned. That You said the counterclock world? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I'm not... Um, there, there are a lot of gaps in my PK dick, but there's a lot of PK dick, so <laughs> there is. Um, is there? There's a book by. Uh, it's either, I think it might be Martin Amos. I, someone's going to call me out on this because I may be misremembering, and I also don't remember the title of it. But it sounds very similar to what you're describing, where the narrator um, is. God, is, the narrator is living like inside the body of like a Nazi war criminal, like long after the war, but he's experiencing this war criminal's life in reverse. And so he, like, he's a hero because he's like assembling, he's like taking smoke from the air 
and turning it into ash and then like building these machines to turn it into people. Is it Time Zero? Yes. Yes, I think it is. Is it Martin Amos? Yeah. I'm too lazy to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, that, that, yeah, that plays a lot with consequences and knowing your fate and things. All right, and uh, Mark, uh, before we go with you and, and, and perhaps the next topic, something, some other work that perhaps you, you know and that you want to mention? or Well, both those works actually remind me of Time Quake by Kurt Vonnegut, uh, which is itself an examination of free will and consequence. And it tells the story of a, of a time quake, which is basically time stops moving forward and begins moving backwards. So everybody is reliving their past uh, conscious that that's what they're doing, but unable to change anything. And I think it's a metaphor for how we feel on a daily basis. We feel so, our lives feel so conscripted and we feel like we're playing roles that there's no real free will at play in our day-to-day -day lives, the things we do. You're just kind of like sleepwalking as we go through our routines. But at some point, the time quake stops and time starts moving forward again. And people have to sort of, it's like people are falling over because they're not used to have to think about walking. Or, you know, pilots are used to just being in the planes and not have to think about flying. So suddenly planes are falling out of skies. And uh, to me, that's a sort of apocalypse. The resumption of free will, not being able to sort of live on autopilot anymore, but actually having to think intentionally about the mundane things that we always took for granted because they were always spelled out for us. Hmm. And actually, that that, takes, that uh, moves us to the next topic that I would like actually Mark to to tell, to tell us a little bit more about. Because, for example, oh, well, the main topic we have already mentioned, the end of the world or the, the end of chapters, as Blanca put it at, uh, at the beginning of the discussion. But, for example, what are some sort of these um, elements that can be better discussed when we're talking about these kind of scenarios, because as you mentioned in, in a regular day, well, you have different kind of conditions, and actually it's uh, it's really hard to make them more interesting. Uh, recently, we have I don't know like movies like uh, Mercy Story that perhaps uh, can so can kind of sound boring because after all it's a, a couple that it's just getting separated and they are fighting a lot, but the way that they tell the story is really interesting. However, there are different aspects that we can discuss, different aspects that we can uh, deal with in this kind of uh, scenarios. And I believe that perhaps in, in uh, one of your first uh, comic book works, or at least one of the first that I had the chance to read in the Flintstones that I seriously recommend, uh, uh, part of the, that was present because you were uh, having a mixture of perhaps regular day, but in a, in a scenario that it was really distant. After all, it was in the um, this fantasy prehistoric time. So, uh, what kind of elements do you feel that are uh, more suited for this kind of scenarios? Well, I, f I feel like I probably write more pre-apocalyptic. <laughs> pre <-historic laughs> even. <laughs> yeah. People, people on the verge of going through some horrible things that they're not aware of yet. Uh, but, I, but I do feel like there's a reason why the, uh, the apocalypse, the post-apocalypse stories are, are so relevant. And I think it's because they work as very grand thought experiments. So it's, it's kind of limiting to just think of them as like stories about people walking through rubble uh, or, you know, uh, end of the world stories. Um, it's, it's probably useful to note that the term apocalypse itself doesn't necessarily mean a destruction of the world. It's, it actually is Greek for uh, that which can be revealed. It's about like, here's a revelation that I didn't understand before. And uh, which is why in the Bible, it's called the book of Revelation or alternately the Apocalypse of John. So I think that's, we should take a broader sort of perspective about apocalyptic fiction, think about, well, what is it that uh, these stories are revealing? Or what is, think not just think about those stories set amongst rubble, but, but what is the, uh, the, uh, the revelation at work here? And one that, that really I, I think about a lot is um, Cormac McCarthy's novel, The Road, uh, well, which, which is about I the- End of everything. There's no animals. Uh, all the plant life is dead, and it, all that is left is people, and they're just sort of cannibalizing and scavenging, you know, each other to till the last one dies out. And what I really love about this is that it, it, it I think, takes what's unique and useful about apocalyptic fiction, which is it performs this grand thought experiment. And to me, the the thought experiment that Cormac McCarthy was asking himself is like. Well, what really matters to us? What is the last thing we would hold on to when all else has been stripped away? 
you know, once the uh, nuclear winter scenario or whatever it is that causes the end of the world in the road happens, the, the first thing to go are obviously our sort of political, legal sort of constructs. They just dissolve overnight. And then obviously your sort of so, social relationships uh, with friends and you know acquaintances as you begin to sort of like bunker down and turn your house into a little fortress protecting yourself against the neighbors that you once, you know, waved to across the street. And then after that fails, you know, you, the, the next one to fail is like your sort of romantic relationships, your the romantic love, you know, his, his, his wife leaves him very early on uh, because you can't live like this. And so that is stripped away. Then the last thing, the very last finger that's left holding on to the limb for humanity, and this is like something that he was able to sort of reveal to himself just by writing this story, is a parent's love for a child. That is the last sort of human tendon that will hold on to until the end of everything. This this man's love for his son and his willingness to protect his son is the one sort of piece of his humanity he's willing to hold on to into oblivion. And I think that that's to me what what apocalyptic stories really should aspire to be not necessarily to be that horrifying, but to be that sort of high-minded in the, the, the sorts of questions they ask them ask of us should be the questions of life and death. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, because after all, that's uh, and that's one thing that actually I, I wanted to discuss because after all, this this helps us to reveal and uh, dealing in this case, as you mentioned, with with, with life and death helps us explore these kind of topics. Uh, Tom, any something else that you want to add, Blanca? Well. I was thinking about Harlan's, uh, Eli, uh, Harlan Ellison's uh, Boy and His Dog, also like uh, some sort of different apocalypse, no? It's even even though they are going through the desert and they yeah, might find a nice place to stay eventually, um, how both of them are deeply human. Uh, sometimes I, I even think of uh, my personal professor's apocalypse as a, a teacher and her cats. So, um, well, pretty much I think that's something quite, uh, well, appealing, not because it, it, it looks easier, but because it, it deals with, well, what's the, what are your neighbors for you? What, what does your student mean to you? what all the so, uh, social uh, regulation uh, is actual, uh, is it worth it, is it even useful, meaningful? I don't know. I, I, it, that's a movie that I'm also book. I enjoy a lot of, uh, because I find it very close to stories like The Road Obviously not that, um, well, not that uh, in a way that it's the same tragic world, but uh, in the way that it's focused more on, well, this is the end of the world and I am going to survive no matter what. And my talking dog is not a, a circus uh, celebrity or, or even an influencer. My dog help. My dog can help me. <laughs> it's some other people. How no? about <laughs> being a cannibal? Uh, who would be no, not a cannibal as a cannibal or actually meat eater, but as a cannibal that it's something like a predator, and it's not something you can consider human. You can consider that thing being a. It's entertaining. It's amusing that living thing over there, but it's also food. How can we think of humanity and the other humans? And how can we take the next step? I don't know. Pretty much like a very sophisticated prehistorical dream. I don't know. <laughs> All right. And uh, we have been talking about uh, humanity, uh, first uh, brought by, by, by Mark and then um, nuclear, uh, nuclear Wolf, as you can find her in Twitter, I mentioned a little bit more about that. And actually, that's uh, the perfect transition, well, perhaps not as, uh, as good as a transition as Tom uh, used to do in, in his show. Uh, but for example, Ian, uh, you have written a lot about these kind of characters. And for example, 
uh, you have uh, been dealing with the, the things that actually make a character human. And even when this character is not human, for example, you have an entire trilogy, uh, the, the Alchemy Wars, where you are dealing uh, mainly with, the, with both kind of characters, with the, let's say, the regular humans, and then you have the, 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 the spark of conscience in a different kind of characters that are actually developing, uh, in this case, feelings, causes, uh, they are developing more, more of an ideal in this case, and more uh, of the kind of humanity that we are supposed to, to have. So uh, the question, uh, or perhaps the, the topic that I would like uh, like you to help us to discuss in this case is what what kind of things about the humanity uh, can can we find uh, in this case in some of the stories that we have mentioned, and what are the things that are actually making the characters, even if they are like a robot or a mechanical uh, character, uh, actually what kind of properties they have that help us explore this kind of humanity, Ian? Um, well, it's, uh, it's been very interesting to hear this conversation because um, a lot of my work deals with uh, questions of predestination and free will. Um, a, those are uh, wells that I, I return to quite a lot. Um, and I, I, I think that the Alchemy Wars trilogy um, in, in the context that um, Mark provided um, very astutely, you know, the meaning, if, it, if you think of apocalypse not as a rubble strewn, um, you know, battlefield, but a revelation or a change, something that wasn't accessible before. Um, the, I think the mechanicals in the alchemy wars kind of, they go through their own apocalypse in the sense that they kind of go through a door metaphorical door um, where there's a revelation for them and their whole world changes. Simultaneously, their makers also have an apocalypse that they would consider maybe a little more on the rubble strewn side because their creations are no longer uh, loyal to them. And so that is a, an apocalypse in the sense of, well, our world just changed. It wasn't obliterated, but our everything we knew about the world is now different. And so we have to, uh, we, you know, the, the sun is still coming up every day, but now um, we don't know what our place in the world is anymore. Um, so I kind of liked, I didn't frame it that way to myself when I was writing it, but now I will, um, having had this conversation with you guys, think of it as sort of two, um, two in related sort of intertwined apocalypses, apocalypses. You had an apocalypse about apocalypses. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're smart, Tom. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, you know, I like the thought of an apocalypse being change. And in terms of what non-human characters say for us, um, to me, the appeal is I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm a little bit nihilistic and I have become more nihilistic over the past few years. And I, I actually find the idea of an apocalypse, some kinds of apocalypse, very hopeful, right? You can imagine, well, maybe there will be a technology that supplants us someday that will outlast us. Maybe it will be better than us. You know, the, the clackers in the Alchemy Wars books, these clock punk robots, they're going to outlist, they're going to outlast humans because they're effectively immortal. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, but you can hope that what they learn from humanity, from sort of watching the demise of humanity, is that they will take something good from it. And maybe the thing that comes after us will be better. So in that sense, I find combining you know, apocalyptic thinking with non-human or post-human or transhuman ideas, I, maybe it's grasping at straws, but I find it kind of hopeful. And you know, maybe something good from us will last. That's a thin thread, but I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, something that, uh, guys, Tom, Mark, Lanka, something that you want to mention about this particular topic before we go to a different one? <laughs> well, pretty fast, we were thinking, um, well, the, uh, last week we were working on Fahrenheit for 151, and some of my students were asking, well, what's the deal? What's the big deal about just in paper, we are already running out of it. No, uh, and they yes. <laughs> well, it was kind of weird. 
until I, t uh, I told them it, some of the, this very primitive, primitive uh, technology technologies are still the best way to keep our memory intact. I guess uh, more like thinking about an uh, organic physical memory. Uh, the printed world, it, world is still the very uh, uh, technological and technical support to keep our memories alive. So uh, that even though we can be in an electric apocalypse, running out of resources, even we can still have books. And it's not about book, the book as a fetish. It's a book as a possibility of uh, being human in another way. Stone tablets, mm -hmm. right? Stone tablets from Babylon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Still read them. I mean, if you could read mm -hmm. Cuneiform. Right? And that's, <laughs> those people are long, long gone. gone, but their stories, mm -hmm. right. we still tell their stories, right? Like their apocalypse happened a long, long, long time ago. But here we are, you know, sun keeps coming up. And actually, you, the storage mechanisms uh, get more perishable as time goes on. Yeah, and uh, for for example, I was uh, person on a personal note. I, if, if you guys who are watching this stream are noticing uh, an improved quality on, on on this stream, is because I changed equipment. And when I was changing from my old computer to this computer, and I was checking my my backups, I found out well, my new CPU doesn't have a a CD a CD room drive. Right? Uh, well, I used to have a, a Blu-ray burner. And I, I, I have piles and piles of content in there that pretty much, uh, unless I buy a different reader, are lost. And for example, Ian, you, you touch a, a really interesting point here because perhaps a, a culture is long gone, but not, not really. I mean, the representatives of this kind of culture are long gone, but part of that are integrated in, in what happened next, in this case, uh, across civilizations. For example, uh, a long time... Uh, a lot of times we, we used to mention that perhaps the, the Roman Empire was one of the greatest empires and, and we have different parts of, of, of elements, different cultures that are actually representatives. Uh, at this very moment, the United States, uh, it's uh, the main uh, creator of content, the main uh, promoter of culture that we have, but China is, is not far from that distance. And for example, Tom, I know that you know a lot of Asian uh, shows because, for example, Korea, perhaps it's actually the next promoter of culture. And it actually helped me to, to mention one of the things that I was actually recommending to, to this panel before. And it's a regular reading that, uh, that reading that if you are a student of communications, uh, at least here in Mexico, is something that you must read it. And it's a, a book with some essays from Humberto Eco. I love the title in Spanish, which is Apocalypticos e Integrados. In English, uh, it was translated as Apocalypse Postponed. And uh, the basic, the, the basic line that it's in, in this essay by Humberto Eco is that you have two currents. Uh, of uh, philosophers. On one part, uh, uh, on one side of the ring, uh, you have the apocalyptics uh, who believe that the mass culture uh, promoted by, I don't know, by, by movies, by TV, by, by mass media, is actually something that is not preserving the essence of a culture. And in the other corner, you have the integrated. And the integrated, uh, they believe that actually, well, you know, uh, after all, popular culture is culture, after all. So we shouldn't be fighting about the, the, the things that the people love to watch because we think about it as a lesser part of the culture. Uh, and this actually leads me for the final question that I would love each one of you uh, to, to help me to, to perhaps to answer or to think about. Let's begin with you, uh, Ian. Uh, what kind of, what elements do you believe that are currently on our culture? Uh, have the qualities to transcend perhaps for the next generation after our, our personal apocalypse or our cultural apocalypse uh, comes, what thing will survive perhaps about the American culture? Just to, to, to put an example. Uh, perhaps it's a tough question, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, every day I hope less and less. Whoa. Uh, like I said, I've become pretty nihilistic. Um, what is going to survive of us? Um, you raise such a good point. I mean, we, we export so much like movies and TV, and it's it, is it just going to be popular culture that we're, that survives us? It might be. It might be. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a very I'm, I'm in a very nihilistic place right now. So I say that, and I don't even feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't worry. But uh, luckily, uh, part of our panel, Mark, you are the saver, you are the positive uh, among us. Uh, bring us some light. What, what, what elements do you believe uh, that will transcend us in this case? Well, if I could choose something, I, th I think it would be um, optimism, or it would be the idea that um, we are not bound by tradition. Uh, what uh, I was just thinking about what uh, what he was saying about the uh, the hopefulness of um, apocalypse or the or the positivity of apocalypse, and it reminded me of Star Trek. And Star Trek is. Um, you know, it's technically a post-apocalyptic, not only because it's about a world built on, you know, the ashes of this, of this uh, global conflict, but it's because it's because it's, they had a revelation and the revelation was that uh, poverty and nationalism and inequality are all just sort of arbitrary social constructs that once you choose to abandon them, uh, you could do away with. There, nothing's permanent. Uh, the idea of, that, of, of impermanence, and, and I think some people, when they when they watch Star Trek, get the idea that, oh, well, they just had this incredible, you know, technological advancements, and that's what allowed them to eliminate poverty and racism and all these things. But I kind of always interpreted it the opposite way. Like they chose to get rid of poverty and racism and nationalism, and once they were able to sort of unlock the true potential of every mind in the human race. Then they were able to solve all the technological problems that face humanity really quickly because they had billions of extra brains working on this problem. And so if there is something that, they, that transcends this time in our, in our culture, I hope it's something like Star Trek. I hope it's something like hmm. an idea that seems fundamentally American to me, that, that nothing is so important about tradition that you can't do something, that you can't trade it in for something better. Oh, there you have it. And actually, we have part of the uh, some uh, luckily a positive note in here. And uh, uh, perhaps this will be will come for a future discussion because I, I, I believe that it's worth it. And perhaps, Tom, you can help me a little bit in here because part of the, the greatness in this case of uh, the, the premise of uh, Star Trek is that you, you take out part of the human conflict, uh, part of the elements that are regular in, in this case on regular storytelling. And what will happen in a world where you don't, don't have to deal with that, when you have to go perhaps out to a higher level of, of understanding and different problems can come in, in there? Well, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's interesting what you were saying, Mark, uh, about you know Star Trek being our, our hopeful uh, our hopeful vision, and and what we see lasts through time often aren't the things that were considered the best in their age, but the things that still resonate. Uh, Shakespeare being that classic example of, of you know not being appreciated in its time, but having such universal themes and being done well that it it lasts. And and I think Star Trek has a lot of those those same aspects. Uh, and and like you said, Dan, uh, in the Next Generation, uh, famously Gene Roddenberry challenged them not to have the conflict come from the humans, and they had to find it elsewhere, which pushed them to tell better stories, or at least to come up with more creative ways of telling stories, uh, because conflict is always what gets our attention as human beings. We, we want to see that. That's, mm -hmm. that's just a fundamental of storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom, what element do you think will survive for the for the next generation of, of, after our personal apocalypse? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I've been thinking this whole conversation that uh, one of the things that I think rings true about apocalyptic literature is that it reflects our fears uh, and it, it is us taking like what we're afraid of to the exaggerated end. Uh, so if, or, or even to the point that we're so frustrated that we wish it would all just end so we could start over. Uh, and, and what tends to last is when those fears are, are still relevant. So I think, you know, when you, when you look at our, uh, our literature and our, and our culture, it's hard to predict what will be that thing that will still be something we, we fear later on. Uh, and, and my guess it is that it won't be things that are hopefully temporary, like environmental catastrophe, uh, you know, like, like the day after tomorrow kind of, kind of stuff, but, but rather things that are, that are, we've never solved completely, uh, fear of death, fear of loneliness, uh, fear of sickness. So, 
I, I don't know, something uh, something like the road might last, not because we're fearing the environmental apocalypse that's shown there, but because it does such a good job of telling what it is to be human as, as, as all of those elements are stripped away. All right. Um, Blanca, uh, last but not least, uh, what elements, the same question, uh, do you think will survive about our, about our culture? There, there are three things I wish they were to survive the apocalypse. I think they would be spoken word, the moving image, and of course gaming. <laughs> those, yes, those three things uh, are the very essential things that make, make us human. Uh, after watching uh, Bernard Herzog's uh, The Cave of, of Forgotten Dreams, oh, that thing is simply awesome, you can see walls, prehistoric walls, uh, walls with images, what, what was that, uh, 32,000 years old. And they were trying to capture movement. And they were encrypted in some kind of uh, primitive language, but very accurate language. They were trying to make sense of the world. And I think uh, we only uh, have had that technology for about a uh, hundred or so years. So I guess that would be the spoken word because that involves uh, being in contact with our human beings uh, in a very platonic way, let's say. Uh, kind of weird because I, I'm a book collector, but I guess uh, the spoken word uh, Something is also very humane, very, very humane. It's not a thing. It's something that is, it carries intentions, desires, and makes us, oh, allow us to bond with other people, also to break the, the, those bonds, also that. And gaming, of course, not because of video games, but because of the thing about being able to play, being able to create, being able to uh, create fictions and to leave them in a very, or appropriate them in a very uh, creative way and a very active way. So I hope those three may survive. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of interesting what you mentioned, uh, particularly about gaming, because, uh, well, I don't know, we know that perhaps music is a, is a coding that we have for memory, and it's it's a way that we actually can can uh, transmit part of our culture because it helps it, it helps you remember if you have the, perhaps in the way of a song. That's what the activity in this case, if you encode it as a game, it, it will, will uh, go on even if if uh, people doesn't relate it to the original activity. I want you probably to mention that if you got the chance, if you have one of those three D three D TVs that uh, were really uh, on fashion like some uh, almost a decade ago. Uh, and you got the chance to rent The Cave of the Forgotten Dreams. It's one of the few movies that it's worth to watch it on 3D. And I, I watched it in, in this case in a, part, in, in a projection. And after that, I bought the, the Blu-ray. And don't worry, they don't pay me anything for promote that. But because you actually have to watch it in 3D to understand how they used uh, with light and uh, with the elements that are in there in the caves. Uh, you can recreate movements from thousands and thousands of, of years ago, and it's something that actually survived and it's, it still remains. In this case, in, in a way that you can ac actually access, even if you don't go in this case to, I believe it's in, Fran in France where they are uh, they located, the right? There you have it. All right. So, uh, unless uh, guys, you want to to go uh, to to mention something else, uh, I will present for the for the, for the last part. Uh, Tom, people can actually reach you really easily uh, through Twitter and through a lot of your shows, right? Well, and I say a lot of your shows because you have plenty of. <laughs> and uh, you have a world that it's actually being uh, published and will be available in in, in uh, some days, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the I mentioned Pilot X earlier. Uh, the sequel to that uh, called Trigger is available uh, for pre-order right now. It comes out March 24th on audiobook uh, and print. And it's a story that even if you haven't read Pilot X stands on its own, but it carries on from the end of that book uh, about you know him having to be challenged to save the universe uh, again. And it's about a a time traveler and his time ship, which has an artificial intelligence that's becoming more aware as time goes on. 
Uh, so if that sounds interesting, you can go get more information at tommeritbooks.com. There you have it. And uh, one question, uh, Tom. Uh, I love the audiobook of the first, in this case, Pilot X. Uh, I believe that it's also being recorded. It will be available after the, the print text. Yeah, my, it's available March 24th as well. Uh, same narrator, Kevin T. Collins. Excellent job. I use love it like that. But in case that I don't want to perhaps uh, listen or read, perhaps I, I want something that it's easier in this case to, to the eye, something that has rolling. Mark, you are actually going to release also a new book, right? Yeah, I have um, a couple books coming out. Uh, I've got The uh, Billionaire Island, as you see on the screen. It's uh, issue number one of that comes out in uh, early March. And I'm reunited with uh, Flintstones artist Steve Pugh on that. DPU did the Flintstones is doing the art of Billionaire Island. And it is itself, like, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, a pre-apocalyptic work. It's sort of a, a dystopian uh, vision of the near future. I also, uh, the first volume of Second Coming, uh, my story about what happens when Jesus Christ shares an apartment with the world's greatest superhero, is uh, available in, in fine comic book stores everywhere tomorrow. And then it comes out to the non-comic book stores uh, again in early March. And there you have it. And uh, when, one of the books that uh, we have been recommending a lot. And for example, one of the things after reading, in this case, uh, the Wonder Twins series that actually came to an end uh, last week, if I'm not, not mistaken. And one thing that I have mentioned personally to Mark, I love the way that you write, uh, in this case, Superman. But then I just realized that, well, you don't need to write Superman because you, because you have your own Superman in this case. <laughs> Yeah, it, originally I had pitched this story as a Superman hmm. uh, title to DC. Uh, but th they liked the idea, but they said, there's no way we can do this with Superman. Go, you know, go, go get your own death threat, son. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, title. <laughs> and you did, and you did uh, amazingly. Uh, Ian, you're also going to publish something soon, right? You were mentioning before. Yeah, um, I have a... Uh, no new book out at the moment, but um, a novella set in the world of the Alchemy Wars that we were talking about earlier is coming out in the uh, March-April edition of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Um, so I think next week, basically. Um, it's the first piece of short fiction. Uh, is that true? Yeah, it's the first piece of short fiction in that world uh, mm -hmm. since those books were published. So I'm pretty happy to get it back out there. All right, and we're really happy about your, uh, your return to, to, to this world. And uh, 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 Nuclear Doctor uh, Blanca, uh, you are not publishing a book, but you are going to be releasing uh, Chaos uh, in an educational way, right? Soon. <laughs> oh, of course. Well, we're going to publish some books by the end of the year, if everything goes as, as planned. Uh, and they will be on a level design, but in a more creative way. Uh, we are making some research on how how levels can be thought as uh, chapters of a novel, so they can be more um, expressive and they can be more, more meaningful. Uh, let's hope we uh, we can do something nice about that and we will get that research published soon, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. And, uh, well, uh, thanks to all the people who have been watching this show. Uh, th uh, tomorrow it's going to be released, uh, not only on Twitch, where, where we are actually uh, transmitting it live. Uh, it has been already, it's, it's already been recorded. Tomorrow the audio version will be available, and also it will be available in the different pl platforms that we have, in Facebook, in YouTube, and all those uh, dark places where you can actually uh, get uh, this kind of information. And remember, remember, guys, that if you want to support this kind of content, uh, there is a really easy way to do it. You can go and uh, support us on Patreon. Yes, we have a Patreon. Yes, we are asking for money. But yes, we have a lot of uh, awesome content. There you can find a lot of interviews also with uh, the, the wonderful panel that we have in here. And uh, for example, one of the things is that uh, for the highest level, uh, we are also releasing uh, something that perhaps I will be soon uh, for trademark uh, violation, but we have a uh, wonderful cheers like the Snyder Scott cheer. Uh, it's for a barber shop, it's not for the, 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 the Snyder Cut of the, the Justice League, so it's a different universe. We, ha we have different kind of content in here. And well, first, uh, uh, thanks to all of you who have been watching this kind of show, and especially uh, Ian, Mark, Tom, Blanca. Thank you very much for your time. 
Thank you very much for your patience and thank you very much for your call, uh, for, for all your knowledge because I believe that we have a wonderful, not discussion, but a, a wonderful revelation about the, these kind of topics. Thank you very much, guys, for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. It was awesome. It was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And uh, let's draw the credits. And perhaps for the patrons, there will be an extra question really, really fast. But I don't know. I'm going to discuss because the panel doesn't know what I'm going to ask them. So let's draw the credits and let me see if they actually uh, are willing to answer a really fast question. Let's go.